Okay. There we go. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What time is it? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started so we can get this rolling right on time. Welcome to the Brown Bag Lecture Series uh, from BRIT, the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. I'm Dr. Brooke Best. I'm the Director of Research Programs here, and I oversee this lecture series, which takes place the first Tuesday of every month. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that this lecture and the accompanying chat on YouTube are both being recorded, and those will be available in the future on Britt's YouTube channel. Uh, any links to the video or other resources, if we need to share those, those will be made available on Britt's uh, website on the event page for this talk. Okay, I will now turn it over to Dr. Morgan Gustell, who will introduce today's speaker. Let me unmute him. Oh, there you go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, thank you especially to our speaker today, Dr. Bort Edwards, who's going to be talking to us about why there are so many dang daisies. Um, very pleased to be able to invite him today to our speaker series. He's a friend of mine for several years, a former office and lab mate at the Smithsonian uh, Institution's National Museum of Natural History. Bort is a plant taxonomist, biogeographer, and plant systemist who uh, does a lot of really neat work combining this uh, phylogenetic and taxonomic data with environmental data to understand how plants interact with their environment along a gradient and then modeling sort of how to be able to predict their distributions. A lot of his work is focused on how plants evolve at the extremes of environments and so today he's going to be talking a little bit about this work and how it's driven or, or promoted evolution in the sunflower family, Asteraceae, or the daisy family. So um, let's see, just a little bit of background. Bort completed his PhD in 2013 at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Um, he is currently an associate research scientist at Yale University and with the Map of Life Project. Um, I, of course, knew uh, Bort as a postdoctoral research uh, fellow at the Smithsonian Institution, where he was working on a project focused on understanding um, in evolutionary interactions with large scale environmental data in uh, the sunflower family. With that, I will uh, turn it over to my friend and colleague, Bort, who uh, will enthrall you for the next hour with um, some of the really cool work that he does. So thank you very much. Cool. Um, well, thank you very much, Morgan. Thank you, Brooke. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and also to Britt for hosting um, this series. It's great to have so many people being able to sort of tune in now and, and share their work uh, from well, all around the country and probably all over the world. So I'm really privileged to be, to be part of this. Um, so as Morgan has very kindly um, pointed out, I, I work on the Daisy family. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about the work I've been doing for the last five years or so, looking at um, the diversity in this group. So uh, how many species there are, where they're distributed and why that might be so. Um, and why there are so many dang, or certain expletive of choice, uh, daisies um, in the world. So um, diversity is, is a really fundamentally important concept. Um, it, it's, it's a measure of how many plants or animals or whatever organism of choice exists uh, in, in your area of interest. Um, and this sort of depends on the time at which you're looking at it, um, Diversity changes as you go through seasons, uh, as you go through years, uh, as you go through fire events, or even through uh, geological time. It also varies at scale. So 
uh, the small plot that you make if you walked out into your backyard will have a certain number of plants or animals in it. If you were to increase the size of the area that you're studying to your neighborhood, you'd find a whole lot of new things would turn up and uh, you could then expand to a sort of global scale. Um, and the patterns and processes that drive um, the number and the assemblage of plants and animals at these different scales has fascinated biologists for uh, many hundreds of years. And again, the reasons for this are not only intellectual, but we rely upon this diversity of plants and animals and resources um, for the survival of our own species. And um, the, the threat that we uh, are ourselves imposing upon this diversity um, is something that threatens our own survival going forward. So understanding what is actually driving, where these diversity has come from, and then where it might be going in the future is vitally important um, to ourselves as well. Um, today, I'm going to be mostly talking about uh, how diversity varies through space, a little bit how it varies at scale. Unfortunately, it is very hard to get an idea of how uh, diversity varies at time at anything more than sort of observable lifetime. So uh, we'll be mostly focusing on space and scale. We do have some sort of an idea. This is a map of uh, native species, so it doesn't include weeds or things that have been introduced uh, for vascular plants um, at a global scale. And uh, this has sort of been generated using some large databases that I'll talk about shortly. Um, but really, it's sort of a computer model um, using sort of what data we have available and extrapolating out. But we can see that uh, we are starting to get a handle on sort of where we find more or fewer plants. Um, in this case, as a heat map. You see that the areas that are hot, the reds, the yellows, the sort of, uh, oranges, that's where you're expected to find the most number of plants. Uh, for whatever reason, for per square kilometer in this case, or per square kilometers, um, you find the most number of plants in these areas. And this sort of tracks with what we sort of know anecdotally that uh, we find high diversity in the northern uh, Andes and the mountain range, the Andes that runs down through South America, um, the Amazon basin, um, the Guyana Shield, which is sort of that north, uh, north northeastern uh, section of South America, up through Central America, into southern Mexico, oh, pardon me. Uh, with also some little hot spots in uh, Central Africa and the Foinbos right down the very tip of the Cape where you find exceptional diversity. Uh, Madagascar there as well, which is where Morgan does a lot of his work, has a phenomenal um, number of plants and animals that are found nowhere else and also packed in very tightly, so rich diversity. And then going through into central, uh, Southern Asia as well. And so we sort of have this, um, this sort of tropical effect where you find a lot of diversity in those sort of middle latitudes. Um, but it's still a sort of quite a gross scale and um, we're still sort of trying to get an idea of what might be driving these processes. If we to look at, uh, so I'm gonna call Asteraceae and Compositae interchangeably, interchangeably at some point, I hope that doesn't ruffle too many feathers. Uh, the names are synonymous, it depends on whose authority you take. So in this case, I'm talking about Asteraceae, but this is Compositae, this is the daisies. So this is just breaking down the sort of map that we saw before into sort of a, a more chunky, um, uh, lower resolution map, which just shows by country where we expect to find our diversity. So this is just species per country for the daisy family. And so again, we can see that, yeah, okay, we, we have decent uh, coverage. We've got some, some higher numbers in the sort of middle latitudes. Africa's looking a little bit sketchy. Um, up in Greenland and Iceland, we're not finding very much, maybe as expected, but it seems like we have fairly sort of good coverage of plants across the globe. If we look at the number of records uh, per country, this is, this is the number of collections, how many times people have gone out and actually collected plants. So sort of another idea of to try and get an idea of sort of how we're, um, we're measuring our diversity. We see that again, we sort of have these sort of Western countries, um, North America, South America, Australia, and Europe are fairly well sampled. Africa is not doing terribly, except for some instances. But again, we sort of get the feeling that maybe we're doing a right job at sort of summarizing the diversity of, of this group um, worldwide. Now, if we look at the number of records per species, so just looking at different ways of slicing up these sort of numbers, how we get an idea of where these plants grow and how many. Um, again, sort of same sort of a pattern. We're getting pretty good number of species. People are going out and collecting the same plants multiple times. That's kind of validating. It means that the researchers are going to the right places and collecting the right things. Um, and so there's an idea here again, sort of getting fairly good global coverage. But if we look at how many records that equates to per kilometer. So now we're talking about how frequently are we actually going out and collecting plants? We find that we're actually not doing a very good job at all. So our data, if we actually start looking at it in a spatial extent, is pretty patchy. 
Um, if you look at Europe, maybe unsurprisingly, you have an awful lot of people tramping around a relatively small space. They tend to grab a lot of plants. Um, and so we have pretty good records for that part of the area. Same with South Africa, we've had pretty good exploration there. And that phone bus area means that a lot of people keep going back there to sample. Um, North America, uh, the US is doing moderately well, we have a pretty good network of museums and collections here. Canada's sort of got a lot of space and not so many people. We can see that we're now we're starting to see that this idea of being able to measure and quantify diversity is actually not as easy as it might seem. And that the data that we're using um, is not necessarily quite as um, well structured and uh, well recorded as you might expect given the sort of the day and age that we're in. So with that in mind, um, we set out to try and um, get an idea of, of the diversity of this family, this, this Composite family, um, in the best way that we can. And one of the reasons we chose this, this group is because it's diversity and because it is relatively well collected. But we also decided to concentrate on North America because as we, as we sort of see before, um, it is moderately well collected. The resources and the collections are pretty good. So it gives us a good sort of a test tube, a good, um, a good case study in which to look at this group of plants. So that's the work I'm going to be mostly talking about today. Um, at a global scale, however, the family, um, it's probably the largest um, family of flowering plants. Depending on how well you get along with the person who studies orchids, they might claim that it's orchids, um, but uh, orchids are horribly oversplit, so it could well be very well be daisies. Daisies and orchids are the two largest groups of plants in the world. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, they used to be found in Antarctica until it became covered in ice, not a particularly nice place for anything to be growing now, so uh, we find them everywhere else. And that sort of 32,000 species that we find uh, makes up roughly 10% of the world's flowering plant flora. So it's an awfully large chunk of the family. It gives us a good sort of point at which to enter into this idea of what might be driving plant distributions generally. So what is a compositae? Uh, what is a daisy? Um, well, they are called compositae because they're actually not a single flower head, except for some very rare instances. Uh, what you see when you see a typical daisy growing uh, in your garden is actually a whole collection of flowers, a little cluster community almost of flowers growing together. Um, so each uh, little head in this sort of large world, in fact, it's two worlds operating uh, within each other, each one of those little knobs is its own little individual flower. The ones all in the center there, they are going to be sexually uh, reproductive flowers. So they all produce pollen and a stigma and they will hopefully get fertilized. They don't have any petals per se. So they sort of make up for their lack of petals by uh, foot banding together in this little tight cluster uh, to attract a pollinator. What they've also done is recruit uh, flowers around the outside. So you see each petal here, each petal is attached to a individual little flower. Uh, most, in most species, these flowers have then lost the ability to reproduce. So they've sacrificed their ability to reproduce, to produce these petals that allows the community to, to be showy, to uh, attract pollinators. Um, the little insert here just shows a close up of those little, those central cluster of fertile heads. And you can see it's sort of, they do look tiny, a little bit like tiny miniature flowers there. Um, they have that dusting of pollen um, and they're waiting for a pollinator to come along and uh, to take that pollen somewhere else. So one of the features of this of this family, and the reason that uh, they are often called the damned yellow compositae or DYC um, by many people, um, just about anybody who goes out in the field and tries to identify them, is that for whatever reason, a very awful number of them are yellow. Um, in fact, they're yellow and they look very, very similar. They have this very open sort of dish-like appearance. The petals are flat. Um, the, the central flowers are also quite flat. Um, and this is not necessarily a coincidence. Um, this sort of uh, very generalist floral morphology is something that allows pretty much anything to pollinate them. They're open, they're available. They don't have to rely on any special mechanisms or structures um, for insects or animals to come along and uh, have a get dusting of pollen. So it's a, it's a very sort of successful, ubiquitous, plug and play kind of a, a flower morphology um, and possibly one of the things that has made them such a successful group. Um, however, you, you do get some diversity within the group. Um, there's definitely the different colors. They pretty much um, cross the entire color spectrum. Um, again, these ones sort of have hung on to that original sort of uh, flat morphology shape, but have decided to play around with their colors a little bit. This could well, very well be due to, due to uh, which pollinators they're trying to attract. Um, the pollinator attraction is important. Um, as I said, the yellow flowers are sort of typically great for attracting your insects, which sort of get to land and wallow around on the pollen. But uh, if you want to become sort of more of a specialist uh, flower where you attract certain types of either insects or maybe even birds or moths, 
which are insects, um, you might want to go down the route of producing a flower that's a different color to attract particular types of birds or animals, uh, birds and animals. And you might want to change the shape of your flower so that you can appeal to the fact that they've got these long proboscises or long beaks. And so you get this sort of different flower morphology depending on which uh, types of pollinators you're trying to attract. And this is something that can drive diversity in sort of flower shape and flower color across many different groups of plants, but also certainly in the compositing. So uh, they're not only just you know, sort of yellow and flat. In fact, you get this whole wide range depending on uh, the ecology, the habitat, the situation of the plant. And so this sort of gives us the idea that this group of plants, as much as they might sort of seem like your typical garden daisies uh, when you encounter them most, is actually incredibly diverse. There's an awful lot of them and they live in a whole range of different environments and they have a whole lot of different forms and functions that allow them to survive in these environments. Um, so yes, you might see your, your cosmos growing uh, in, in your garden when you step out this afternoon, but uh, it comes from a family and a lineage that is actually full of all sorts of interesting types and shapes. Um, these uh, relatives grow into small trees, and we see here they're actually quite woody. Um, these things can grow for many, many years and uh, provide sort of a, a resource for people to uh, make homes and uh, structures and are really quite, um, quite uh, sizable shrubs and trees. Uh, you get sort of your um, your shrubby, scrubby, dry, adap dry adapted daisies that uh, don't look anything like the thing in your garden. Uh, the leaves are sort of all very different and the flowers are quite diminutive. And then you get the things that you might be more uh, familiar with. You get sunflowers, uh, thistles, which are also a daisy, artichokes, which are closely related to thistles and daisies, uh, lettuce as well, uh, dandelions, marigolds. There's a whole range of plants within this, within this family. Um, so the diversity is, is immense. In North America alone, um, the sunflowers, thistles, and tarweeds um, are sort of major components of the family, are still comprising probably more than one in 10 of the plants uh, in Mexico, North America, uh, Mexico, US, and uh, Canada. But quite how this diversity has come about is still pretty much unknown. So there's been some speculation as to uh, what may have driven it. And uh, they're very fast generation, have a very fast generation time as a rule. A lot of these things are small and her herbaceous, so they can flower very quickly, they can grow after rain, they can turn over. This allows them to set seed very quickly to uh, take advantage of situations that other plants might not be able to, um, to tolerate, and also allows them to evolve quickly. If you have a new generation every year, you mutate more rapidly, it allows you to adapt to your uh, environment. They also produce a lot of seed, so if you're sending out a whole lot of children into the world, the chances that one of them um, comes good is uh, greatly increased. They also produce a lot of secondary metabolites, so the chemicals that they uh, use or they produce that they don't want to use for anything else, they often turn into things that may be a form of chemical defense against uh, pests and insects, or maybe even manage to modify their environment in some ways. And again, this is a, a mechanism that might allow plants, and these plants in particular, to, to sort of thrive and prosper where other ones don't. But many of these adaptations are actually sort of in, as a result and as from the stimulus of the underlying environment in which they grow. And so uh, we decided to sort of try and come in at this very bottom level at the underpinning um, sort of drivers of what might be um, pushing this diversity in the group. And the idea that not only uh, is it the environment that might be driving the diversity, but it might be that they seem to particularly uh, enjoy growing in challenging environments. So in order to do this, uh, we have uh, number of data sets available to us um, for sort of main tranches. We have spatial data. So uh, for several years or many years now, uh, all the herbaria around the world, museums have um, digitized and then collated all their uh, records in a big online database. So you can go into the database and you can ask, uh, where is what is this species? And then download all the uh, places, the localities that it's been collected uh, around the world through time. This is an incredibly valuable resource. Uh, unfortunately, the quality of the data is always quite suspect. Uh, there's a lot of typos, a lot of misidentifications. Uh, so data cleanliness is an issue, but our tools to deal with that are certainly coming a long way. Uh, the second layer that we need is the environmental data. So if you want to know what environments these plants are growing in, we need to know what the environment is. And again, in the last few years, we've seen the generation of large global scale maps that map uh, soil in the case of soil grids, climate in the case of climate, climate in, place, in the case of uh, world climb. And then at sort of on a local level for North America, the USGS has uh, geochemistry data. And these are sort of maps that you can ask if I have a locality point from my spatial data and I put it on the map here, what is the value for the soil, for the climate, for the geochemistry at this point? Uh, something else you might be interested in is the morphology. So why, what does my plant look like? This has typically been sort of one of the slowest um, 
sort of data collection methods. You have to sit there with a ruler and measure a whole lot of characters. But in the last even couple of months, um, we've seen machine learning. So um, museums have been scanning pictures of their specimens, and you can then take a computer and go through and automatically measure a whole lot of characters. So the amount of data available this way has exploded just in the last couple of years. Uh, and the final sort of level of data that we need is our phylogenetic data. So this is uh, DNA data, sequence data from people who've gone out um, and uh, sequenced the DNA of different plants, and then use that to try and um, to try and predict the relationships between these plants. And so you can end up with a family tree of the group that you're interested in. And this was always this was sort of traditionally relatively fast moving compared to some of these other forms of data, but we've actually started to see it slow down. Um, the idea that we should generate more data, sort of whole genome sequencing now, uh, often means that we're going back and we're sequencing the same plants again. Um, but our breadth, we're not necessarily starting to sequence as many new species as we were. So it's actually surprisingly starting to lag behind some of the other sources of data. So how do you make a phylogeny? I'll just go this through this very quickly, just in case uh, not everybody is familiar. So we have our four plants here. Um, they look kind of pretty. We know they're different somehow, but we don't really know how they're related to each other. So we uh, go ahead and we sequence the DNA for each of them. Uh, the DNA tells us that uh, each one is a little bit different somehow, and sort of the code is a little different between each, uh, each of those four. And using those differences, we can sort of cluster them together. We run algorithms that calculate the relationships um, of these plants, and we can push that back through time and inferring sort of ancestors that no longer exist that were common to, to some of these species. So uh, the two species on the right may have sh uh, shared a common ancestor at a certain time, and then all these plants would have shared, shared an ancestor even further back in time. So that's how we could construct a phylogeny. Um, how is this going for the Compositor? Well, um, it's it's a work in progress. Uh, only last year, we finally managed to get sort of a backbone for um, this group. So an awful lot of effort went into developing which parts of the DNA to sequence. Um, and they sequenced a, a whole bunch of species. But when you're dealing with sort of 32,000 species, um, we really only managed to touch the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and this means we sort of have, as I said, a backbone. We get an idea now of where some of the groups within the family fit. So we call these tribes. Um, and so each of these little uh, branches here represents a tribe. And within each of those tribes, there might be hundreds, many hundreds of species. Uh, we don't necessarily know the relationships within those. But we can now get an idea of where these tribes, how these tribes relate to each other. As you can see, I've colored some of them yellow here. These are the tribes that are majority found in North America. So um, their ancestor arrived in North America and they radiated out and have sort of mostly kept the family um, within the continent. And so when we're looking, if we're going to study the, the role that radiation or environment has played in the radiation of these groups in North America, um, we're going to concentrate on these groups because they give us sort of a, an in situ and in home sort of isolated idea of, of what this group might be doing. Um, so uh, we, we identified uh, 13 of these tribes. Um, however, um, 10 of these are actually sort of very closely related to each other. So it could be considered a single unit in some ways. That's the group down towards the bottom there, the Helianthi group, the sunflowers, uh, and the tarweeds. But we also have the Asteriae, which looks like it may have arrived in North America independently of that Helianthi group. So it sort of offers us a, a separate independent evolutionary lineage in which to sort of ask these questions. Uh, the Vernaniae as well, and the Cardiae, which is your thistles. Uh, so we sort of have four or nine, depending on how you want to look at it, different sort of groups of plants that have uh, evolved in North America that we can ask these questions about um, how their diversity may have arisen through time. Uh, just as an idea of how these groups break down, there's about 4,000 species uh, in North America in these groups. Um, the Asteria, sort of a large fluffy um, sort of seaside daisy group, about 900 species. Uh, the Cardio, which is your thistles, about 87, although one of my colleagues is probably going to bump that number up a fair bit. Um, the Venonia, which is a bit of a mess and a grab bag of species. Uh, we don't really know a lot about what's going on within that group. Uh, it's about 120 species. And then, as I said, you get the, the sunflower group here with um, a whole lot of sort of nested uh, tribes um, that vary from just a few species, just a couple, all the way up to uh, 500 plus. So how do I go about this? So as I said, we have these databases of spatial data. So I downloaded uh, about 2 million records from this centralized database that represents um, uh, collections for this group of, these groups of plants um, in North America. As we can see, that looks pretty good. Looks like we've got pretty good coverage. Gets a little sketchy as you get north and uh, fewer people running around. But uh, it, it sort of looks to all intents and purposes as though we've got pretty good coverage there. I should be confident that my data is, is pretty well covered. 
However, um, if you clean that data, as I said, there's some bad names or the, the location isn't very accurate. Um, those two million records dropped down to about half a million records. So we lost about uh, three quarters of our data. Um, this reduced the number of species that we're actually dealing with down to about 3,100. But that's still a pretty good show for, for a large group of plants. In order to get an idea of sort of how diversity operates, uh, you need to sort of define the area that you're looking at. Um, and you could ask, what is the diversity of North America, like the maps I showed you earlier, and just give a single number for the entire continent. But if we're interested in looking at how this changes over the landscape, we want to divide the landscape up into smaller units. So we um, draw a grid that's of uh, grid cells that's 100 by 100 kilometer kilometers on each edge. And then we calculate how many species, how many of these collections fall within each grid cell. So if we're looking at diversity, this is two ways of measuring diversity. One is turnover. And this is how, if I move from grid cell A to grid cell B, how much do the species, the types of species and the number of species change as I move from grid cell A to grid cell B? And we can see here, the, the hot colors suggest that there's a lot of turnover. So as I move across the landscape, species are coming and going, moving, uh, you know, so the species comp composition is changing quite quickly. And we see that sort of surprisingly in some ways is really quite consistent for many of these groups over their entire range. It starts to get a little bit um, a little bit less around the edges, sort of start to run out of species. But generally it looks like daisies are turning over quite rapidly. So suggesting that you have um, species that uh, either don't have particularly large ranges, so you sort of come upon them and then leave them behind again, or you have lots of sort of overlapping ranges where as you move across the landscape, sort of as old ones fade out, new ones pop up again. So this idea that uh, the landscape is actually quite sort of changeable in terms of uh, what species you're likely to find. If we look at richness, so this is maybe sort of a more intuitive measure of, of diversity and one I'll talk about mostly. This is just how many species do we find in a grid cell? So uh, we can see it's definitely not quite as uh, homogenous as the previous maps. Um, and we find that there are some common patterns here. So you get a lot of species in the sort of western, southwestern of the US uh, running through uh, Mexico and presumably down in towards Central America. Um, and this seems to be a sort of repeated theme across, across these different uh, tribes, these groups within the daisy family. And this is not necessarily particularly unexpected. People know that the daisies are particularly diverse. In fact, uh, the California province is diverse for many groups of plants. Um, but it did start to make us think about, so, okay, if we're looking at it environmentally, uh, what is it about these areas that um, is different to the rest of the continent? And one of the things that sort of kept coming up was that these regions, the southwest of the US, uh, central Mexico in California, um, a lot of those regions are quite um, quite inhospitable to, to many plants. You have a lot of desert areas there. You have lots of changes in uh, altitude and gradient fairly rapidly. Um, and you have a lot of soils that are not particularly hospitable. You have serpentine and gypsum and uh, sort of weathered leach soils that um, have a lot of chemicals that plants might not necessarily particularly want to hang out on. So we started with this hypothesis that maybe it was sort of the extremes of the environment or that these, these areas were more extreme than we might expect. And it was uh, something about uh, daisies has allowed them to exploit these extreme conditions. So um, how do we define an extreme? This is actually quite difficult. Uh, extreme is sort of a grab bag of different um, terms and variables. Uh, what is extreme in one place is not necessarily extreme somewhere else. What is extreme to one organism is not necessarily extreme to another organism. Um, so for example, if you go to the desert, you might find that uh, not only is it hot and dry, you also get a lot of solar radiation, you get a lot of sunshine, um, you have a lot of uh, chemicals in the soil because it doesn't get washed away. So all those things may be extreme at the same place. Uh, alternatively, you, you uh, maybe travel up the continent and you come across a bog and you find that the inverse is true. You have so much water that the plants are sitting in it, that they can't breathe, uh, the water might freeze during winter and the ice cracks the stems. So you have more situations where you have a different set of variables that are also extreme. So how do we characterize that? Uh, we have cold environments, we have hot environments, and we have environments with uh, different soils and uh, geology like bottom right here, we have a little serpentine outcrop. So how do we go about sort of summarizing this um, across a whole bunch of very disparate variables? Uh, what, is, what is extreme? So uh, we sort of rough and ready this at this point. Um, and, and that is, we sort of um, decided that by definition, um, the comfortable envelope of survival is sort of in the middle range of variables. So um, your sort of your nice temperate climate, your nice temperate rain, uh, where things are sort of normal is where you'll find most things. So by definition, extremes are rarer, the extremes sort of at the fringes. Um, 
And so if we wanted to find extreme, we should be looking for those fringe ends. So if you were to plot, say, the, the distribution of rainfall across the continent, you find that sort of a lot of the continent receives sort of this middle amount of rainfall. Uh, and there's sort of the fringes, the extremes, have either a very, very little amount of rainfall, so deserts, or have an awful lot of rainfall. So maybe a sort of uh, northwest um, sort of uh, temperate or tropical uh, temperate rainforests. So by definition, extremes are going to be the top and or bottom ends of all these different variables. So how do we, uh, how do we uh, untangle these and pull these out? So as I said, we have um, some... Uh, globally um, globally produced maps uh, that represent these different variables. We have climate, uh, soil and elevation, and geochemistry. And putting those together, we have about 182 different variables. And clearly, not all of those are relevant. A lot of things plants just aren't going to bother about. Also, a lot of those co-vary. So um, a lot of them, a lot of those variables are things like the wettest month of the year, but then there might be the wettest, wettest quarter of the year or uh, the wettest season of the year. And those things will often vary together. So if you look at the wettest month, it probably in the wettest quarter, which is probably in the wettest season. So if you were to include those three variables, they'd start to get in each other's way. You start to either start to take power away from each other and explaining, um, explaining your data, or they sort of drag the data in their direction. So you want to remove variables that are very similar to each other. So we did that. Um, I won't go into how we did that. It's a very dark art, um, but it's, it's sort of looking at uh, plotting the variables and just seeing how they line up against each other. Doing that, we uh, reduced those 181 down to 24 relevant uh, non-correlated variables. So for each of those variables, uh, so in this case, we've got uh, mean uh, humidity for the year. Um, we calculated the uh, top um, 95, 95th percentile of land mass for that variable. So we asked where in, say, North America do we find the top 5% humidity in this data set? We did this separately for each different continent um, because we, the plants uh, are going to be sort of exposed to their local environment. Asking what the top 5% of humidity is globally might give you one little chunk of uh, sort of Central Asia, um, but that's not an area that the plants in Australia, South America, or Africa are actually exposed to. It's not relevant sort of on a global scale for them. So by dividing the continent, uh, the the, uh, the world up into areas, we hope to sort of mitigate some of that sort of scale effect. So we asked what is the, the top um, extreme uh, range for this variable in North America and the other continents. And then we did that for all our 24 different variables. Um, and so we now have, we can ask, uh, where do our plants go, grow in relation to, say, the, the most extreme for wetness or precipitation? But what we can also do is ask, where do all these different extremes overlap? So if we stack those layers on top of each other, we can ask for this grid cell, how many of those different layers, those different variables are extreme in this grid cell? And so we can see here, that's exactly what we did. And we have a map of the world here. We find that at most we get eight of those 24 variables overlap in the same place. And that happens right around the middle of that sort of the elbow of South America there in the Andes, uh, where all those different ex extreme variables come together. And that's our most extreme point. Uh, but looking at this, um, you might sort of recognize some of this pattern from a little bit earlier. We have sort of high extremes, the darker colors in uh, southern western US, um, Baja Peninsula, in Mexico down through Central America, uh, the Andes running down through South America, uh, the Foinbos, the south, south of, uh, of Africa, uh, running through the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and a little bit in Australia. So it sort of makes some gut sense that we seem to be seeing some sort of a match with uh, plant diversity. Um, it also makes sense with where we know these sort of extreme environments are. We have our hot arid deserts, we have our high mountain ranges. Um, so it's sort of validating to see that that's popping up where we'd expect. Uh, so our hypothesis now, is that the number of overlapping, as the number of extremes increases, as our number of layers overlap, um, species diversity will actually decrease. So um, we don't, we would expect that plants don't actually like to, to grow in these sort of dodgy conditions. Um, you have a hot, dry environment, plants might tend to steer clear. So that was our sort of null hypothesis. So we take our diversity map here from earlier, uh, and we extract a value for uh, 16 and a half thousand uh, grid cells across this map. And then we extracted an associated value for um, the extremeness map that we had just generated. And if we do that and plot one against each other, we can see here on the y-axis, we have richness. So this is uh, the number of species. And on the x-axis, we have the number of overlapping extreme classes. So how extreme the environment is. And we can see that 
as uh, extremeness increases along the bottom there, richness is an initial peak, but then it crashes quite strongly. Uh, and it looks like, yes, this is actually true. Um, plants don't like particularly extreme conditions. There is a little kick towards the end here, but it's not significant. Uh, the blue background here is a randomization of the data, uh, and that sort of shows us what we'd expect by chance. So anything, any of our observed data that falls in this blue cloud um, doesn't fall outside chance. So for you can see, for where it's significant, we have a kick and then a drop off in our diversity. So yeah, it looks like globally, uh, as conditions become more extreme, uh, the, plant, the number of plants drops away. Uh, just for anybody curious, uh, we did try and correct for uh, latitudinal gradient. There's an idea that as you move towards the equator, the number of plants increases, and so that might have been an artifact in our data. Um, but if we uh, co correct, we regress it against latitude, uh, we find that the signal uh, still applies. We still get this crash in diversity as uh, extremist increases. Uh, how does this break down by continent? So we see sort of Africa and Eurasia and South America. Uh, as expected on the global scale. Um, we see a drop in diversity as extremeness increases. Australia, not quite sure what's going on there. It seems like everything just lives in a really nasty environment. Um, so diversity kind of just muddles along regardless of how extreme it is. What's really interesting though is that North America here, uh, we actually see an increase in plant diversity as extremeness um, increases. This is slightly confusing and puzzling. This is, goes against our original hypothesis. So what might be going on here? Well. Um, I'll just skip through this. This is just which in particular variables. Um, well, okay, I'll just quickly that uh, we, there are some common variables if we to look at to look at sort of groups of variables in our data set. Um, water limitation seems to be very important in Australia and North America. Um, Australia uh, has high UV stress, which is uh, strongly correlated with plant richness, and North America it's heat stress. Um, so we can sort of tease out which individual variables might actually be driving these signals. But what is going on in, in North America um, specifically? So we know from our work that we're, we're already studying the DAISY group, um, that we, we have a map uh, that shows richness of this group um, just for North America. You can see here we've plotted uh, the circles, uh, the number of species is the size of the circle, and the extremeness um, for that grid cell is the color of the circle. And we see that sort of, yeah, by gut, that looks like it, it sort of lines up, that as cell, uh, circles get larger, um, the extremeness increases. So if we repeat the analysis before where we plot those against each other, we see, wow, it's an even stronger signal here. So for the daisy family for North America, as uh, extremeness increases, uh, richness just keeps on going up. So again, this is sort of quite surprising sort of in a general sense, but what we know about the daisies, this might not be quite so, um, so surprising. Uh, they do sort of favor these conditions. So we know that North America has this general trend and the compositae have this trend, but how much of that sort of signal for North America is actually being driven by the daisies? Is it just daisies that are seeing, that, that are sort of enjoying these nasty conditions and are particularly diverse? So if we actually subtract one from the other, uh, we find that we almost reduce that signal. So if you just look at uh, plants that are not daisies in North America, um, we see that uh, there's a non-significant tick at the end, but really it looks like most of the rest of the plants do not see uh, an increase in diversity um, as extremeness increases. So it looks like daisies are actually really driving the signal of, of plant composition, and certainly when it comes to um, extreme uh, environment composition uh, in North America. So I guess the next question that we were interested in is what, what are the specific environmental variables that are driving this diversification? Um, and so we know that this sort of southwest region of the US has been dry and weathering uh, sort of slowly through wind, but not very much rain um, for, for many um, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, um, which is in contrast to the rest of the continent, a lot of which has been going through glacial cycles and we've had um, ice sheets come up and down sort of in the north of the country. Um, this sort of southwest area has been relatively stable and relatively dry. And there is a hypothesis that uh, if you have these sorts of conditions, the plants that grow in them are going to start to sort of adapt to these, um, to these dry, poorly leached weathered conditions. And this is the species poor hypothesis. And this says that uh, we would expect the plant group to sort of grow and sort of evolve under these conditions that they're going to start to favor um, geochemistry that is um, extreme. So we have high sodium levels and high pH levels in particular. These plants are going to be able to adapt to that better and we should see that as those variables increase in the soil, uh, so the diversity of those plants increases to a point. So this is a testable hypothesis that we can do with our data. And indeed, so uh, we ran some models and this just plots 
the, um, the number, the richness of species as uh, you increase in your variable. So in this case, the x-axis along the bottom here uh, for the left column of each set is uh, pH, and we have richness on the y-axis. Y um, I've just highlighted here what is considered optimal pH for plant growth. And you can see that for the majority of these uh, six tribes, the, the largest increase, the largest bump in plant richness is actually uh, above this sort of optimal growth zone. So um, we have what it looks like is that these plants actually uh, have a greater increase in diversity um, above and beyond limits considered sort of typically uh, enjoyable by most plants. So um, this, this is sort of um, fits with this hypothesis that they may have evolved uh, to tolerate these conditions. Uh, we see for uh, sodium, the Na, um, I've just marked out in lines here, this is the 85th to 95th percentile of values for the US. So it's right at the sort of, oops, the, the sort of top end of, of sodiumness uh, in North America. And uh, you can see, again, we actually get a common sort of bump uh, in, in the richness of these tribes uh, in this either a bump or it's part of a sort of a general increase. So it looks like um, there's an increase in richness at these sort of top levels of sodium um, across these tribes. So this suggests that, um, yes, it looks like these um, groups of plants have been growing in these uh, old, pauper, leached, uh, sorry, not leached, but um, highly um, geochemically enriched soils for a long time. They've adapted to it, and it's actually what sort of helped drive their diversity. So just sort of as a little bit of a side, um, do we see the same response to the environment that we saw with sort of just richness, which is how many plants are growing in my cell, as we do with phylogenetic diversity? So as we, as we saw before, we, we produced a, uh, a phylogeny, which is the sort of family, the relationship of species. And we want to know that um, is, are there, are there, are there uh, times in the history of this group where they've produced a lot of species? And if so, is that associated with any particular environmental variables? So is, is the environment pushing how fast species generate um, within these groups? So as I said, we have some issues here in that we, we really only still have a backbone for the family uh, and um, getting an idea of the family tree is problematic. So we set out to, to generate our own phylogeny. Uh, and to do this, we use some of those large public databases that I mentioned referred to earlier. I won't um, go through too much of it just to say that um, we sort of used an iterative process um, because um, there are a lot of errors in the data. So we downloaded a whole lot of sequences. We generated a tree. We had a look at the tree and decided whether there were errors in there that we, um, we could correct ourselves. We corrected those, reran the generation of the tree again until we ended up with um, what we considered to be a, a fairly robust um, tree representing these these 14 uh, tribes in North America. Um, and it looks a little bit like this. So we have about 1,600 taxa. So this is about half half of the, the species uh, that we're interested in that are growing in North America. So the resources are available, but we're still missing about half the species. But it gives us a decent starting point to start asking um, how the relationships of these plants and how quickly those species generate may um, be associated with the environment they grow in. Just to say that these results are still not great um, because we're sort of uh, building these trees from this sort of public data set. Um, we have a lot of re uh, relationships that aren't properly resolved. Uh, we don't know how good, we can't sort of put a confidence on, on how good the relationships are. Um, and there's sort of bias, people who've gone out and sampled a lot of species in one particular group, whereas there are other groups of plants that people just haven't bothered to sample. So the trees aren't necessarily particularly um, well balanced. But this aside, it's a good starting point. I'm definitely not going to go through all the methods of how we look to see how our environment was associated um, with diversification rate, mostly because I haven't had my coffee, um, but also because uh, this part of the work was done by two of my colleagues, Chase Mason and Eric Goolsby. Uh, if anybody would like to talk to, about the methods, so I'd be more than happy to. Um, but there are a sort of a number of series of methods that you can ask. Um, if if I have a number of splits in my tree, if I have a number of species being generated, um, is that faster than I might expect by chance? And if it is faster than expected by chance, is it associated with uh, any particular environmental variable? Um, and so. Unfortunately, again, because we don't have as much data as we would like, we lost about uh, half the, the tribes that we were interested in. But for those that are remaining, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
um, we can see that these are the variables uh, underneath uh, the name of each tribe, and they are the variables that are found to be um, associated, to be significantly associated with either increased or decreased diversification rates in that group. So, for example, the GTE here down towards the bottom, we see that there's a positive association where feldspar, which is a, a mineral in the soil, is high. Uh, that means that diversification is increased. Uh, where aluminium is uh, high, we find a negative association. So aluminium seems to lead to a decrease in diversification. Not necessarily to look at all the different variables here, but uh, we can see that almost all the variables that are associated with changes in how fast species are being generated or going extinct um, are uh, soil or geochemistry variables. So the substrate is also playing a very important role in how fast species are generating and turning over in, in the daisy family. And this backs up our work, uh, the previous section, showing that these sort of old, weathered, um, highly, uh, highly uh, mineral-rich soils um, are playing a, a disproportionate role in diversification of this group. This group. Um, and in some cases, again, just this, this, the environment actually accounts, you can ask, uh, what proportion of, of turnover of diversification in, in your family um, is, re is, is responsible for, from environment. And we can see here that almost 60% of the species turnover, the species generation, uh, can be attributed to environmental variables that we tested. Um, and that varies for the different groups. Some groups seem to have more or less reliance on the environment. Um, but again, just that we have this sort of environmental factor, mostly soils and substrates, that seems to be driving uh, why we have so many daisies through evolutionary time. Um, just to sum up, sum up um, what I just said. Um, so, why? I mean, we, so this is this suggests that the environment is really important. Um, but uh, what what we can't say is where these plants came from originally. So this is this is a phylogeny um, from late great Vicky Funk. Um, again, it's just a backbone. It shows the relationships of all the tribes uh, worldwide. And it's colored by country, uh, not to worry about which country is which, but these plants these daisies are, are distributed uh, across the world. So the plants that have arrived in North America and that we are seeing of having this great diversity and explosion of radiation in uh, Southwest US, um, we don't know where they originally came from. So it's quite possible that the ancestors that pitched up on the shores of North America millions of years ago may have come from somewhere else where they were already exposed to conditions that were kind of nasty and dry and difficult. And so what we don't really know and what we would like to get a handle on but can't yet is, um, was there some sort of a pre-adaptation? Did these plants sort of come ready-made to jump into these sort of gaps and niches in the landscape and explode and radiate? Or is it something that they did sort of uh, in situ? Is it something that they have invented and evolved as they've gone along? And that's something that we would like to look at. Um, this idea that uh, is it that they have responded sort of directly to the environment or did they come here and exploit the environment? Um, just going to say that the scale at which you do analyses is very important. We used 100 kilometer grid cells, but you could use any size of grid cell. And this sort of goes to the fact that when you're talking about diversity, um, you can talk about it at global, local, or, or regional scales. And if we redo some analyses, um, instead of using 100 kilometer grid cells, we use 3,000 kilometer cells, so it's ridiculous. But we color the cells, we color the map by which environmental variables um, come up as being um, significant in, in driving diversity. At 3,000 kilometers, at this large gross scale, so sort of landscape scales, we see that climate and topography are um, most significant, the sort of purples and blues. But as we reduce the size of our window, the sort of the scale at which we're asking these questions, we find that soil and geochemistry, the green and the red here, start to become more important. So what we're seeing when we're doing our analyses are what's sort of turning richness and diversity at this local scale, this sort of 100 kilometer scale. If you were to dig down even further, even deeper, we'd probably get a different result again. So what's what changes diversity from this side of a mountain to the other side of a mountain to a river to outside the river. Um, so it, it's very much a snapshot of what is going on at this sort of um, moderate landscape scale. Um, but uh, just to sort of plot it out here, we see that, um, yeah, if, if you do your sort of analyses at a really large continental scale, you sort of find climate is important. Local scale, it's your chemistry. And sort of in the middle there somewhere is sort of where these variables cross over in, in how they're explaining the, the richness and diversity of, of this group of plants, certainly anyway. So it, it's important to understand that uh, we're talking about sort of one level of interactions here and what might be driving sort of local processes may very well be different. So just to sum up, 
Um, so spatial environmental data, sort of some of the broad scale take homes is that uh, we have this data now available. And it's great fun to be able to play with it. We can ask some really cool questions, um, but there are still sort of issues with the data. Um, we don't have the phylogenetic, phylogenomic resources that we would like. And in some ways it's actually starting to lag behind. We have all this environmental data and spatial sort of where things grow data and um, morphology data is starting to come along. But uh, we're still actually sort of grappling with how these plants are related to each other in many ways. Um, and that's a problem with um, any group this size, but uh, one that we sort of need to sort of work towards uh, solving. We do have some methods, these sort of bootstrappy methods of making our own phylogenies, um, but they're not great. We lose a lot of our data. So something we'd like to improve on going forward sort of as a community. Um, and the significance and influence of, of what variables might be driving uh, diversity change at scales. Uh, so um, you know, what, what sort of questions you want to ask uh, is going to sort of influence how, what scale you ask questions at. But um, maybe most interesting for me and for us as plant people is that um, we, we find that we can use this data to ask really cool questions. And from this, we see that uh, glass, vascular plant richness, so plant richness globally, doesn't the plants don't like extreme environments. Um, maybe unsurprisingly, they kind of tend to avoid it. But in North America, we see this is actually flipped around, um, that we have a greater richness of plants in these extreme environments, um, but that almost all of this can be explained just by the composite, by the daisy family, which really seems to have this love and affinity for, for um, harsh environments. And presumably this is because they have, uh, it seems like from our data that this is because they have evolved in these um, difficult situations, which has allowed them to, to specialize in them, to radiate, to become diverse and um, to succeed in them. Um, and uh, looking at how these diversification rates, how species have accrued through time, and this certainly supports that. So just a little bit about the future. So this work is ongoing. Um, as I said, this work was what I have just talked about. It's mostly what I've done at the Smithsonian for the last few years. And um, I have just started my position at Yale University in the Map of Life. And the idea is that we're going to try and take this to a global scale. So instead of just concentrating on North America, um, we're going to be able to look at the diversity and distribution of the Daisy family uh, across the entire globe. And ultimately, we'd love to scale it up into all vascular plants. And so that's the ultimate goal of the Map of Life. And if you haven't had a chance to go check it out, um, it's a great and growing resource on being able to map and identify uh, where different groups of species occur. And you can uh, generate a list. If you want to go somewhere, you can drop a pin and it'll spit out a list of species, mostly animals at this point, um, but species that you're might likely to encounter um, wherever you would like to, to, be, to, to go. Um, what we're hoping is that Again, sort of looking at this on a global scale, we can sort of continue to ask these questions about um, what is the environment doing to, to drive diversity um, outside just of North America. And I guess sort of a lot of what this boils down to, as I said, the daisies in particular sort of seem to be well adapted. They have seeds and um, leaf chemicals and other sort of uh, life traits and histories that allows them to be successful. So the environment is what sort of facilitates this, but what is it that the plants have that allows them to exploit that? Um, and so ideally the, uh, the next step would be to look at seed characters or life history characters and see which of those things also correlate with the extreme environments. What is it about the actual plants themselves that has driven, allowed them to, to become successful? To do this, we're also going to be working with the Compositae community. If any of you out there are Compositae experts, um, we're looking to sort of leverage your expertise. Um, we want to sort of try and uh, improve our understanding of the relationships um, so that we can sort of use this data going forward. We need expert taxonomists to generate lists of where species grow and where we might expect to find them so we can have a good spatial data, and that will feed into our uh, diversity and evolution research. Uh, I'd like to thank a whole a slew of collaborators, uh, Walter Yetz, who's my current supervisor and a colleague at Yale, Jennifer Mandel, who um, helped me through all of last year, um, and then a whole a whole raft of people from USGS and other universities who um, have been essential in keeping this project going and um, sort of tackling these questions at such a large scale. But most of all, I'd like to thank Vicky Funk, um, sadly no longer with us. Um, she was an absolute inspiration for anybody studying plants, anybody who uh, enjoyed uh, nature and diversity and just being a good person. Um, she uh, had an amazing passion for this group in particular and 
um, we'd like to think that the work that we are doing is uh, going to drive her legacy forward and anything that we can do to better understand um, how this, this amazing uh, group of plants came to be and what it does um, is something that she would uh, she would wish us to do. So uh, it's a sort of tribute to Vicky and uh, all the people that she has fostered, she fostered throughout her career. Uh, leave you with the references and if uh, there are any questions i'd be more than happy to take them now or i'm sure you can find ways to contact me afterwards thank you excellent fantastic talk board thank you so much for that we do have some questions coming in um i'll try to go through them here so from early on uh see earlier in your talk we had a question from weston testo he asked do you have a sense of approximately what percentage of north american asteraceae specimens are misidentified in herbaria <laughs> oh ah hmm, too many um, I mean, it's an excellent question. I, it's it's in there somewhere. I of those two million specimens that I had to throw away, one and a half million. Um, I've seen, and I've seen other studies that have sort of estimated it's sort of in the fifteen to thirty percent um, sort of range is misidentifications. Um, our biggest problem is that we just probably don't even know a lot of the misidentifications that creep through. You have to have a known set that you can compare to an unknown set and then see what the difference is. And that takes an awful lot of work. Um, you need to have people who can validate your identifications. But best available evidence that this is that we're sort of dealing with 15 to 20% of our um, IDs might be suspect one way or another. Um, that depends on the group as well. But yeah, it's definitely an issue. Um, whether it affects the results in the end, if, if it's just that you have the wrong name on something for diversity, for diversity analyses, that might not be a problem because it's just unit A and unit B, sort of different name, but they're still you know, sort of an individual, a data point, a unit. But if you have things like species um, that have been misidentified that no longer exist, where they should be merged with another species, uh, you're, then you're getting sort of inflation of the number of species. Um, so you do want to try and make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and um, that is certainly a problem. I don't think that number is up in the sort of the 15 to 20%. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a problem. And it's something that uh, part of the work that I'm doing at the moment is to just come up with a really robust way of, of um, bullshit checking our data and going through and cleaning and curating it. So yeah. Okay, let's see, we have another question about, um, let's see, breeding systems. Are breeding systems in Asteraceae correlated with these extreme environments? All right, excellent question. Um, not just because I thought of it myself. Um, no, uh, it is an excellent question. And I sort of touched on it at the end there, that's really what we want to try and get into next is that we, we now have the environmental data, we have the spatial data, um, we have the phylogenetic data, so we can say where are things, where's this richness, and what's the environment it's seeing. What we don't have is that that trait data, so um, not only morphology, but breeding systems as well. And so that is definitely the next layer to bring in, is to say, okay, we know where these things are extreme, we know what they're responding to, but what do they look like when they're responding to it? And breeding systems is going to be one of the things that I think would be very, very interesting to check. Um, don't have a standing hypothesis yet, open suggestions. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely something that we'd expect to, to have a signal or, or certainly be worth testing. Great, uh, a couple more questions. So our, our collections manager here at BRIT, Tiana Raymond, she asked, how can those of us generating the digital specimen records adjust our methods to reduce the amount of time you spend cleaning our data and prevent you having to throw our data oh, records out? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, wow, if someone can come up with a solution to that, I'll love you forever. Um, uh, I mean, honestly, a lot of it is, it's difficult because some of it is sort of inherent in that different uh, herbaria often even encode their data slightly differently. So um, just the initials of the, of the author for a species, um, whether you put a space in between the period and the next initial means that the record will come at as a comp as not unique. And it means I have to go through and remove all the spaces, say. Um, but that's something that, you know, one herbarium does for a reason and another does for a different reason. And 
there's no necessary necessary standard for that. Um, it's a lot of it is just errors. So just teaching our students really well, um, you know, miss typos, um, just sort of getting little things wrong, wrong punctuation, um, putting question marks or um, hyphens in names that shouldn't have hyphens, little things like that can just get very frustrating. Um, but uh, it's really just to curate that data. I mean, if, if, if it can be, the better it can be curated at the museum level, so someone goes through and checks it and double checks it and triple checks it, and I know that takes time and money, that makes it easier for everybody else downstream. So uh, it really is just um, making sure that it's done well the first time. Okay, we have a question from Peter Fritsch. He asks, it might be difficult to test, but could comp diversity be correlated with sunny versus shaded habitats? Um, right, so definitely there is a suggestion of, we know that compositae don't grow very well in sort of forests. They're not massively tropically happy plants. Um, they don't seem to like being shaded out. Um, so that's definitely a thing. Uh, as to testing it, it is probably doable in that there are GIS layers that show canopy cover, and you could probably sort of do some analyses to test canopy cover um, against diversity. It would be a different sort of, it would be getting at a different sort of um, level of diversity of what we're going at at the moment. Um, I don't think that if you were to say, I, I don't think that shade is necessarily playing as important a role in these southwestern habitats. I don't think that assuming that everything else is equal, you, you're Plants are adapted to dry and um, and high salt soils. That if you chuck a tree in there, I don't, I'm not sure that you're going to be able to tease out much of a shade effect there. Um, I think it would be a sort of separate question, um, sort of globally, where you find denser forests. Do you find less plant uh, less um, composite diversity? Uh, and I think yes, that would be the expectation. And I think the data is probably out there to do it, and someone probably should do it. Um, whether that's me and I have the time, I don't know if someone would like to talk to me about doing that. Um, more than welcome to, to, um, to look about working something out. Thanks. Okay, it looks like we have one more question, at least from the feed here, from Oscar Hinojosa. Some other families, such as Cactaceae, Amaranthaceae, Papaveraceae, occur in extreme environments, and they are not as diverse as Asteraceae. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, ugh, okay, I'm just making a fool of myself not knowing their ecology so well. Um, I mean, I guess, again, we're sort of back to the next level of question is going to be, what is it about the, the daisies that allows them to be diverse? Um, and I can, I can give you reasons why we think daisies might be good at it, those dispersal, lots of seeds, um, chemical adaptations. Um, so it's tempting to say well, the cacti, the other things don't have that, therefore they're not as good at it. That's where I'm going to put my foot in my mouth, so I don't know, but that would be my feeling is that there is something that the daisies can do, um, something about their life history or their physiology, physiology that allows them to be so, so diverse. Um, what that is, what is what is not in those other groups, I don't know. Um, it could also just be that um, there is something else going on there. They um, those cacti and things um, have been through bottlenecks for other reasons. They've had lots of species wiped out for some reason. Maybe they were more diverse in the past, and something uh, something has sort of wiped them a lot of them out, so they look like they're not so diverse. Um, that's also a possibility. Um, so, yeah, that. Uh, that touches on a really good point, though, that um, this is great to ask these questions of a single group, but I mean, we want to know sort of these broad patterns, so we want to know what's going on with other groups of plants, why are other groups of plants not doing it, why other groups of plants are doing it. So these comparative studies are definitely um, another thing we would like to do going forward, is to pull in groups of plants that are not daisies and ask the same questions, and then you can compare and contrast and see what's different and what's the same and start to draw a sort of global scale um, what's going on here questions. So uh, that doesn't answer that question great specifically, um, mostly because I don't know, um, but something I'd like to know the answer to. Yep. Okay, we are a little bit over time, but there's just a few couple questions left. If you've got okay. time, Bort, we'll yep. okay. Um, we've got another question here from Weston. 
he says taxonomic concepts and lots of Asteraceae genera very conspicuously at broad scales, thinking dandelions in Europe versus North America. Any possibility this could have a major impact right. on analyses? Yeah. So it definitely can be a problem. So I think the, the point we're getting at here is that um, what people consider a species can vary. So um, you can you could take what one person sees as one species in one part of the world. Someone comes along and says, "Ah, it looks a little bit different over there. Looks a bit different over there. Looks a bit different over there." I'm going to call it three different species. Um, and so you can have this sort of you get sort of inflated diversity maybe because someone's splitting things up differently in one place compared to another. Definitely can be a problem. Um, I guess at this stage, because we're concentrating in North America, hopefully that is less of a problem, at least for this this study. Um, if I was to do a study in uh, Europe, um, you'd maybe want to do that study sort of separate to the North American and compare the results sort of um, quali qualitatively, not quantitatively. Um, it, it could be a problem within North America. Different people working in different areas, different regions might have different taxonomies. Um, but part of, part of the data cleaning process is to go through and come up with a a sort of a, an idea of what taxonomy you want as a, as a researcher and what you think is a, a good taxonomy, and you hope to sort of get rid of some of that variation. Um, but yes, certainly, comparing between areas, between countries can be difficult, and it's something I would not want to do without um, addressing that sort of a problem. Excellent. Um, Let's see, Morgan, did you have anything you'd like to add? Any questions? Uh, none for me, no, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. For me, especially, I think having an opportunity to connect really some of the dots between doing the digitization to getting the downstream analyses, the kinds of um, questions, scientific questions you can ask when you digitize specimens at a massive scale like this was really neat to see. And you know, here at Brit, we have this um, collaborative uh, NSF grant for coordinating the uh, digitization of herbaria between Texas and Oklahoma. And so we're just doing this right now at our herbarium and um, being able to see what you can do with that data when it comes out on the other end um, was really kind of enlightening. So thanks, Bart. It was really excellent talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, thank you. I especially have a, um, I saw I, what jumped out at your heat maps was there's this nice boundary between very high, uh, what is it, northern Mexico diversity, and then strangely, just across the border into Texas, very low. Um, so that just jumps out as there, that's a gap. We got to get down there. We got to yes. do some, some yes. extra exploration. Um, our our efforts are still, uh, are still sort of patchy in many areas, and, and that is a problem. And um, sort of compensating for that is difficult. But I, I mean, as, as Morgan points out, you know, his herbaria are, are other ones who are donating this data in many ways, and it's 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 with the effort of all these collectors and workers over hundreds of years that allows this research to be possible. And all the people sort of watching now who might go out and collect plants, um, it, it might seem like a little thing to go collect one plant, one or two plants every now and again, but um, it all comes together into this sort of big scale um, data sets and ideas. And um, yeah, incredibly indebted to to, to generations of scientists. Well, thank you again for being with us today. Uh, I want to remind everybody that, let's see, um, next month we will have uh, Dr. West Testo will be giving a talk on uh, South American club mosses. So please tune in to that a month from now. Um, and thank you, Bort. Uh, we appreciate everything you do <clears throat> and all the wonderful research coming out of that lab up there. Thank you very much. No, it's been a pleasure. All right, take care, everybody. We'll leave this up for just a little while, um, but we're going to go, we'll go silent. <laughs>